She's not dead. Just paralyzed. Huh. So that's what you were practicing on those protesters last week. I couldn't figure it out. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Invincible Season 2, Episode 1 video. Congratulations, you made it. It's been a couple years since Season 1, but we finally got Season 2 episodes. So if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get them all. I'll be doing weekly episode videos. They're going to be airing the first four weekly, then they'll take a break and air the second four, like the second half of the season, early next year sometime. But they didn't say exactly when the second half is going to premiere. Careful for spoilers, if you haven't seen the episode yet, we'll just start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, starting with the episode title, A Lesson for Your Next Life. It's meant to be a reference to a couple of things. Metaphorically, Invincible's next life after Omni-Man, his father, left the revelation of his true heritage, what the Viltrumites are planning for Earth. That's all still a really big thing that he has to deal with. He just hasn't got to that point yet, like he's still dealing with the actual grief in the aftermath. Pretty soon we'll be talking about what the rest of the Viltrumites are planning for Earth in the aftermath too. Like on the other side of the equation, you still have Omni-Man who's out there. He'll come back into the story eventually and the Viltrumites will come back into the story. Still a very, very big threat. But basically Mark is kind of starting his second life. He's kind of like rebuilding his life, so to speak. The episode title is also more of a literal reference to the multiverse Angstrom Levy storyline and the alternate version of Invincible that we see at the beginning of the episode who sides with his father and winds up taking over that version of Earth. In fact, during the episode, the main version of Angstrom Levy even reveals that in most alternate universes, that Invincible winds up siding with his father and they wind up taking over the planet. He turns evil, basically. Remember that world-changing battle between Omni-Man and Invincible a month ago? In most other dimensions, they teamed up and took over the planet. So it's actually very unusual that this main version of Invincible turned good, turned against his father. That's one of the reasons why he didn't want him to die at the end of the episode. Like, no, 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 we actually need him for later. He'll be really important. But this first half of the season is basically all Angstrom Levy stuff. Like, he's the main villain for the, at least the first four episodes. I don't know if he's going to be the main villain the second half of the season, but we'll see about that. The first half of the season, we're kind of dipping our toes in the Invincible multiverse. It'll become a bigger thing later in the story, too. But because it has been a couple years since they released season one, they do an extra long recap before the actual episode starts. The real opening scene starts on that alternate Earth showing you what happens when Invincible turns evil, sides with his father, and they take over the planet. They're in the middle of a fight with the Immortal, and I don't think the original comic book said too much about what went down in this universe that caused him to side with his father, but Angstrom Levy did say that that happened in most dimensions, so in most cases he wound up turning evil. I think part of the idea is that what was different in the main universe that caused him to be good was all of his positive relationships, like the positive influence of his mother, the positive relationships he had with his friends, and he just didn't have those, or like his mother wasn't around in the alternate universes. So it was much easier for his father, Omni-Man, to influence him to join the Viltrumites. They basically want to show you, though, that this alternate version of Invincible, even though he is evil, is very, very similar to the main version who is good. This version of Omni-Man is also pretty much exactly the same as the main universe version. Their fight is also meant to kind of foreshadow the journey that the main Invincible is going through this season. Like, during the fight, Immortal says he's just like his father, and it's meant to be an insult in this case. But later in the episode, when the main universe Mark is talking to Cecil, he insists that he's nothing like his father. He's not going to turn out like him. Cecil's right to be cautious, though, because they use this first part of the episode to show you what things look like when he decides to side with the Viltrumites. Like, it goes very, very badly because he is nigh invincible. Like, not totally invincible yet, but he's getting stronger and stronger by the day. Like, during the fight, they want to show you that he's not quite as strong or quite as good or experienced as a fighter as the Immortal, but when his father Omni-Man shows up, he makes quick work of him. So you have to remember that in most universes, Invincible will theoretically become more powerful than all the Viltrumites given enough time. Like, it's just like a bodybuilder. They can make themselves stronger over time, and because they virtually stop aging at a certain point, they can theoretically live forever and just continue getting stronger and stronger and stronger throughout the years. So there really isn't like a limit to their power level. But with most versions of Invincible here, like you're seeing them at the beginning of their timeline, their power's just activated, so they're at the weakest state that they'll probably ever be. We'll kind of see this through his development, like the next couple of seasons, like he'll continue to get stronger and stronger and stronger. He'll have to be if he's going to fight the other Viltrumites who will eventually show up. Probably going to be a while before that happens, though. Like people wondering when Conquest, when Anissa are going to show up. There's like a lot of stuff that happens in the comics between season one and what they're doing right now before they show up. 
Their actual fight scene here is pretty solid. It's cool to see how things go down when he and his father fight together. They're basically unstoppable, effectively invincible, just to make more puns on the title. Technically, Omni-Man is powerful enough to take over the planet himself if he wanted, but that's really not the Viltrumite way. Like, his whole mission is to create a half-breed sun, set up that sun as the ruler of the planet, and then move to another planet and just repeat the process over and over and over again ad nauseum because they'll just theoretically never die. So they're basically taking over the universe the slow way. There's a very important reason why they're using that tactic that we'll get into later this season. Like, they tease it in the trailer, so we'll probably see some Easter eggs for that in a couple episodes. There are a couple really dark jokes about Immortal's powers when Mark squishes his head. Immortal your way out of that. I think the idea is that theoretically, he could heal himself if they were able to stitch him together, but he squishes him so hard that he's effectively as close to dead as you could possibly get. They reveal what's happened to the rest of the planet because this is meant to take place after they've already conquered the planet and the Immortal was really just distracting them away from the Resistance's base. They play back a recorded message that Invincible did about the Viltrumites taking over the planet and what it was actually going to look like. They're basically going to wind up treating Earth like a glorified colony, taking its resources, and treating the humans kind of like cattle. Like, as long as they don't cause trouble, they will be left alone for the most part. One of the notable changes in this alternate universe is that he does say the full line, I am invincible. Usually they just cut before he says invincible to the title, which they do at the end of the episode. Like, that's the big trope of all the invincible episodes. I won't rest until I get Then they reveal this universe's version of Angstrom Levy, who does not have multiverse powers. He sneaks to their base we meet their version of the Guardians of the Globe, who are mostly the same, they just look a little bit different, but all the relationships seem pretty similar. The green water is meant to be organic material that Adam Eve created that just helps them sustain themselves underneath ground. One of the other changes in this universe, too, is this version of Robot is a little more open about his true self, like he walks around in clear view with his body visible to everyone else. Kind of like this version of the character doesn't hate his own body as much as the main universe version did. They reveal Invincible and Omni-Man killed their version of Rex Splode. The null energy that Angstrom Levy plans to use is just a form of energy that's super strong, effective enough to do something against Viltrumites, but it barely scratches Omni-Man. That's them basically saying that they're nigh invincible on this planet. They also clarified that this universe is universe number 646, which I think is meant to be a Robert Kirkman real-life Easter egg for the Marvel 616 comic book universe because there is a Marvel crossover with Invincible comics that he actually wrote. That's right, way back in the day, there was a Spider-Man crossover with Invincible. Invincible appeared inside a Marvel title. So, like, Angstrom Levy is meant to be able to portal to the Marvel universe. That's, like, one of the other alternate universes he has access to. But even though that's canon in the comics, I don't expect to see any big Marvel cameos or Spider-Man cameos, for that matter, during Invincible Season 2. The showrunner was kind of coy about that. People asked him, like, will there be a big Spider-Man crossover like the comics? I'm not going to hold my breath for Marvel or Sony letting them borrow the Spider-Man character. But the Marvel Universe is technically canon to the Invincible multiverse. And I know the follow-up question that a lot of you are asking now, what would happen in a fight between Omni-Man and Homelander? Because both Invincible and The Boys are Amazon series, so it'd be much easier to cross those series over. They actually joked about that too, and most of them agreed, like Robert Kirkman, all the Invincible people, agreed with The Boys creators and all those people that Omni-Man would wreck Homelander. Just the way the character is designed, he's meant to be way, way more powerful than Homelander. Really big coincidence that they're both characters in Mortal Kombat 1, so you could actually both play them against each other and actually do that fight. They wind up finding their base, either killing or crippling everyone, basically finishing their takeover of this planet. Ani man kills this version of Robot in, like, the coldest possible way. But you should have died at birth. When he tells Omni-Man you two will eventually die, he is correct. Like, eventually, Omni-Man will die, but not for a long, long time. And they want to show you how twisted this version of Invisible has gotten, like how evil he winds up being. He snaps Adam Eve's neck so they can keep her kind of like a pet, the same way that the main universe version of Omni-Man talked about his wife. Basically the same sentiment, like he thinks of Earthlings as pets now, and that's how he's going to treat Adam Eve. Basically keeping her against her will, unable to move because she'll be paralyzed for the rest of her life. That's why it's so much worse, because killing her would have been a mercy. Like, no, 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 I would never kill you. I'm just going to keep you for all time. But you can kind of blame the bleeding of all the different minds of these other Angstrom Levies into his own mind, because he says in most universes, the alternate Invincibles always wind up turning evil, so all the other Angstrom Levies probably hated their versions of Invincible. 
that's kind of why he winds up being a tragic villain because initially he had very altruistic purposes for wanting to do this and wanted to get Invincible's help, at least the main version of the character, because he had turned good unlike the other alternate versions. Whereas now he's kind of twisted into this super villain kind of state trying to get revenge against him instead of trying to heal the multiverse. When in fact he himself was responsible for causing the accident so like he should be blaming himself not blaming Invincible. Then we finally go back to the main universe version of Invincible and see him staring at the mountaintop where Omni-Man almost wound up killing him. He's got this PTSD from the events in season one. There's this montage showing him going around trying to clean up messes, take down villains, basically atone for everything that happened and prove to the world and himself that he's a hero and everyone can trust him again. The song they're playing is Radiohead's Karma Police. The lyrics are meant to be a reference to everything Mark is going through right now, like the whole concept of karma just in general. There are a bunch of characters they featured in season one that they bring back as part of all of his takedowns. This is Elephant. He basically has the same powers as an elephant. He's meant to be a parody of the Rhino in the Spider-Man Marvel comics. These thugs he takes down work for Titan. That's his symbol on their chest. Remember, Titan took over Machine Head's syndicate after they defeated him, so he's like the new crime boss in town. The Lava villain is called Magmaniac. He's a parody of Molten Man from the Spider-Man Marvel comics. And this is Tether Tyrant. He's a parody of Dr. Octopus, both Spider-Man villains, basically. He has a couple PTSD flashbacks to the fight with his father. He remembers the train. That was probably one of the most WTF things during that episode. They actually turned that train scene into Omni-Man's fatality during the new Mortal Kombat game. They just released a trailer for it a little while ago. It goes so hard. These soldiers that show up with the stars on their arms and the special armor from the Global Defense Agency, basically Cecil's normal human army just wearing high-tech gear. And I love the way the regular cop here reacts to it, like, okay, fine, whatever, just do your thing. I'll just sit over here and wait. You have to imagine in a world full of superheroes and supervillains is like this for a lot of normal people, like normal law enforcement agencies. We're, like, We're just sit here and wait for the superheroes to take care of this. It's also a little bit like this in the boys universe too, but the difference is in the boys universe, all the superheroes are kind of dirtbags and don't really care about the police officers. They go back to their house, they watch the news, they sort of address the aftermath of Omni-Man and what's going on with his mother, how they're kind of dealing with it. One of the big changes that they made to season two and future seasons is basically expanding the season because the episodes are an hour long, so they have like way more material to fill. So Robert Kirkman and the writers basically gave extra story to a lot of the side characters like Mark's mother that they didn't really give her in the comics. Basically giving everybody their own little arc. Like all the Guardians of the Globe stuff, they get a bunch of extra material that wasn't in the comics. Then we go back to the Global Defense Agency's prison. We see the Maulers again after season one who are taunting the guards that they crippled the last time they escaped. The main Angstrom Levy teleports them to another world to get their help finishing his device, basically starting their relationship. When they're escaping, they pan around to the other cells. This is Multi Paul, who's Duplicate's brother, who's on the Guardians of the Globe. Basically, they have the exact same powers. They got them because their ancestors were cursed. The only difference between them, between brother and sister, is that the brother, Multi Paul, works for the Order. They're like an evil organization in the world of Invincible. Then we meet the main version of Angstrom Levy, played by Sterling K. Brown. I mean, he plays all the different versions. He'll be the main villain for at least this arc of the show. Basically, he's able to teleport to any universe in the multiverse, but he can't teleport around within the same universe. He can only teleport to other universes. He's also got a son who has the exact same powers. We might wind up seeing him in a future season at some point. Maybe they'll tease him this season. The way that he explains it, though, the other Angstrom Levy's out there, like any of the other thousand that he gets, none of them have powers like he has. When he says that he'll leave the Mahler twins here in this wasteland Earth forever if they don't agree to help him, that's also foreshadowing for something that he does in the future. When Mark goes back to school, Todd going full 180 on him, trying to be all nice, is also meant to be the same arc that Mark is going through himself right now, basically trying to prove to everyone that he's not going to turn out to be like his father. Like, no, I mean well, I'm actually trying to help everybody now. He's still going out with Amber here at the beginning of the season. They at least start out with them wanting to go to college together because they both wind up getting into the same college, like having a normal life. But the whole idea is that you can't really be a superhero, like the demands of being a superhero are too much for doing all the normal human stuff. So at some point, like all these different threats that he's dealing with on Earth, all the Viltrumite stuff that will eventually catch up with him, and all the extra drama with his father, like it'll all come rushing in and probably wind up destroying his personal relationships. So we'll see how long his relationship with Amber winds up lasting. They kind of blew past this super quickly in the comics, but like I said, the show is expanding on a bunch of these side stories. 
Then he basically asks Cecil for more work, like he asks him to call on him for more help, but he doesn't really agree to it until Mark says that he'll join the Global Defense Agency and work by his rules. The whole idea here is that Cecil's actually rooting for him, even though it sounds like he doesn't want to have anything to do with him. Like, he wants him to be true when he says, I'm going to be good, I'm not going to turn out like my father, but he's right to be careful, like he's no fool. That's why he has all those contingency plans, like the reanimen, all the ways that they're trying to affect Viltrumite cells. Like, right now in his current state, they could probably stop him if they needed to, but given enough time, he would theoretically become invincible to them. When he goes back to the GDF, the monster that the Guardians are in the middle of fighting is called the Giant. He's basically like an eight-year-old kid who fell through a portal with his grandma and was cursed by a wizard into this form, like into this giant form that tried to use him against his enemies. He wound up eventually breaking free, then he got banished by the people of that Earth back to the main version of Earth where you now see him, and that's why they make all these references about him wanting to be an astronaut, wanting to be president of the United States. Oh, he sounds like an eight-year-old kid because he is literally an eight-year-old kid in the body of a giant. Basically, his problem is kind of like the opposite of Monster Girl because she's an adult woman stuck with a reverse aging curse, so she just looks like she's a little girl. Giant is like a little kid trapped in a big person's body. They also use this scene here to remind you that Donald's spine has finally healed since the events of season one when Omni Man crushed it. They basically explain, though, that the Guardians aren't doing so hot as a team, like they don't have a lot of cohesion, so they bring Immortal in as well as Bulletproof to try and beef up the team. Robot is also still trying to get used to his new body, all the emotions that come with that, like being in actual battle, as they say, is basically feeling fear for the first time, because he used to just remote pilot the robots from a distant location, so it was more like him playing video games as opposed to actually being in a fight. Then the Maulers basically fix Angstrom Levy's machine, they start to activate it. As he says, he had very altruistic reasons for wanting to do this, but those wind up being perverted through his own actions, causing that accident, basically turning himself into a supervillain. The whole idea is these corrupted by the minds of all these alternate Angstrom Levy's who all hate their universe's versions of Invincible because they all turn evil and destroy their worlds. Back at their home, Olga comes back, Red Rush's wife, to check in on Mark's mother, see how she's doing. I think the card that she left her has something to do with the Global Defense Agency. And like I said, all this extra story with Mark's mother wasn't part of the comics, this is just them expanding her storyline. Everybody knows what's going on with Immortal, he's back after they put him back together, basically sewed Humpty Dumpty back together at the end of Season 1. Bulletproof is played by Jay Farrow, and he has a super WTF backstory. Like, he's not quite as powerful as Invincible, but he's almost as powerful, enough to sub for him when Invincible leaves the planet every once in a while. Bulletproof was born with a twin brother who experimented on him against his will in an attempt to give them both powers. He basically used him because they had identical DNA, they were twins. So the theory was is that if he could give his twin powers, like if it worked, he could use them on himself to give himself powers. He wound up being successful, Bulletproof's brother gave him powers, but then wound up accidentally killing himself, leaving Bulletproof alive in the ashes. He has a bunch of different powers, probably the most important one is the energy shield that he generates. It can absorb pretty much anything you throw at him. He also doesn't need to eat or drink anything, he can actually absorb energy basically and turn that into sustenance. He can fly, he has an enhanced healing factor, he has superhuman speed, strength, reflexes. Like I said, not quite as powerful as Invincible, but still really, really strong. And it seems that they're kind of using him as a foil for Rex Splode on the team, kind of putting him in his place. Adam Eve comes back into the story to visit Mark. They're still on really good terms. She's kind of into him, but they're mostly thinking of each other as friends right now. That'll probably change by season three. Like, we're all kind of looking at our watches, wondering when they're actually going to get together, just because it's a real big thing in the comics. You can let me know when you think that's going to happen. Like, I think it's probably going to be season three. Maybe, maybe like the end of this season they'll tease that, but the beginning of season three. The whole idea now, though, is that they both share very, very traumatic backstories. I did a video for, like, that whole separate Adam Eve spinoff episode. It's kind of like a prequel episode. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend checking it out. I'll put a link for that video down in the description below. You thought that Invincible's backstory was messed up. She takes that to, like, a whole new level. Then Invincible, agreeing to work for Cecil, arrives at Angstrom Levy's to try and blow off some steam, but winds up falling to a bunch of multiverse versions of the Maulers that Angstrom Levy had working for him. They almost wind up killing him, but not for Angstrom Levy, stopping and accidentally blowing up his own machine. Like I said, this is meant to be his tragic supervillain origin story, because originally he had very good intentions. Initially, the reason why he didn't want the Maulers to kill Invincible is because he hated the idea of bloodshed, but also eventually wanted to get Invincible's help in fixing the multiverse, at least until his mind was corrupted. 
Now we just want some cold, hard revenge. But they are very clear to hammer home the concept that Angstrom Levy is the reason why this accident wound up happening. Invincible is not to blame for anything. The rest of the Guardians of the Globe seem like they're on Invincible's side, except for the Immortal, who's still really, really wary of him. Then in the tag scene at the end of the episode, they reveal what happened to Angstrom Levy. He was disfigured in the accident. His mind was corrupted, looking for revenge. He looks just like he does in the comics, too. Really, really messed up. Then they do that standard Invincible title trope that they do in most of the episodes where they end the episode with him not saying his name. They just cut straight to the title, but it's covered in blood for the accident that just happened with the screen cracked. It's meant to represent the accident that just happened in the warehouse. With a small tag scene of the one surviving Mauler crawling away, complaining about not working for anybody else ever again. Overall, it was a great first episode. Cannot wait to see how they follow this up the next three. There'll be four episodes, like I said, the first half of the season. So I'll be doing weekly episode videos for it. Make sure you enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss any of that. And there were so many Easter eggs and references in the episode, like so much stuff they're setting up. If there was anything big in the episode that I didn't mention in the video, just write it below in the comments. There's a bunch of really big stuff coming up. They just dropped a brand new Echo trailer with Daredevil and Kingpin in it. I'll do a video for that next that should post on Saturday morning. Then my boys Gen V finale video. And next week, my Invincible episode two and my Loki finale videos will be posting. So there's just a lot of really big stuff happening right now. Click here for my full Loki season two episode five video and click here for all my other Invincible videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.